The Bible shows us the journey of ancient Israel from the literal land of Egypt on into the earthly promised land of Canaan is a type of the journey of God's people from this sinful world to heaven. And the Bible shows us this in verse number 11 of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Their journey typifies our journey, the journey of the Hebrews. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse number 11 says, Now all these things happened unto them for ensamples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And verse number one says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So once they left the literal land of Egypt, heading on into the earthly promised land of Canaan, the Bible says they had to cross this Red Sea. And the crossing of the Red Sea by the Hebrews, it typifies baptism. And after baptism, what did God feed them? The Bible tells us God gave them spiritual meat. God gave them spiritual drink. And what God is showing us, since their journey typifies our experience in these last days, after baptism, after we are baptized, Christ wants to bestow. He wants to give us spiritual meat and spiritual drink. First number two, First Corinthians 10. And we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. And the Bible is showing us that this must also be our experience to receive of Christ the spiritual meat and the spiritual drink after baptism. Last time we met, we discovered as a movement, the Seventh-day Adventist movement, God's remnant movement, crossed the anti-typical Red Sea, October 22nd, 1844. And the, book, the Great Controversy confirms this on page number 457. So the Bible is showing us after, or I should say since, October 22nd, 1844, Christ specifically is offering and he wants us to receive his spiritual meat and spiritual drink. Great Controversy, page 457. It says this, the history of ancient Israel is a striking illustration of the past experience of the Adventist body. God led his people in the Advent movement, even as he led the children of Israel from Egypt. In the great disappointment, their faith was tested as was that of the Hebrews at the Red Sea. And what did did the Adventists experience that great disappointment? It was October 22nd, 1844. So on that very date, we crossed the anti-typical Red Sea. God pulled his remnant movement from Babylon. God pulled his remnant movement out from the world, out from the spiritual house of bondage. And God is now serving spiritual meat and spiritual drink. The last time we were together and we looked at the first part of this series, we looked at the spiritual meat. This evening we want to focus on the spiritual drink. And 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 3 and verse 4 tell us that Christ wants to give us this spiritual drink. In the literal sense, what was this spiritual drink that God gave to the ancient Hebrews? Once they left Egypt, once they crossed the Red Sea, once they were baptized, write down on your notepaper that the spiritual drink represents the literal water. The literal water was called spiritual drink because it was given to the ancient Hebrews by God's miraculous power. Hold your place in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Let's turn our Bibles to Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17, Bible says in verse number one, 
to verse number 6, that God gave them this literal water, which was spiritual drink, because it was given to them supernaturally. Exodus chapter 17, verse 1, verse 2 said they cried out, because they were thirsty. Verse 3, verse 4, and verse number 6. Now God said to Moses, Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. This was spiritual drink, the literal water. But also you must understand this spiritual drink represents literally the literal water. In the spiritual sense, the spiritual drink represents Jesus Christ. Write down the spiritual drink of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 4. It represents Jesus Christ. Go back with me. Hold your place in Exodus chapter 17. Go back with me. The 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 4 confirms, And did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So once they were baptized, once they crossed the Red Sea, Christ was showing them in parable, in type, they were to partake of him. They were to drink of that spiritual drink. They were to partake of Jesus Christ. That's the only way they could maintain spiritual life. And God is saying to us in the application for us who are living in these last days, after baptism, we must receive spiritual life. Since 1844, October 22nd, specifically, God is serving us spiritual drink. His people must partake of spiritual life, Jesus Christ himself. Now notice again, go back with me to Exodus chapter 17 and notice where the spiritual drink came from, the water came from. And I want you to write down the spiritual drink we had previously, spiritual drink equals literal water. Spiritual drink equals, it points to Jesus Christ. What you wanna write down in connection with those points, the spiritual drink also represents the water of life. Water of life. They are dying literally, dying of thirst. And the water that Christ gave to them miraculously and supernaturally, it preserved their life. So that spiritual drink, it represents spiritual life. Exodus chapter 17. Where did this spiritual drink come from? It came from Christ, but from where literally? The Bible says the spiritual drink, it came from Horeb. Look at verse number 6 with me. Behold, I stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. So the spiritual drink, the Bible says, it came from Horeb. What else came from Horeb? Write down, from Horeb, God also gave to ancient Israel the Ten Commandments. So from one location, from Horeb, came two principal things. The water of life and God's Ten Commandments. Hold your place in Exodus chapter 17. Close 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Let's turn our Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 5. Are we studying God's Word? Hope you have your note papers and your Bibles. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 5. Look with me at verse number 2. From Horeb. And Horeb is synonymous to Mount Sinai. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 19. Bible says God spake those uh, Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is synonymous to Mount Horeb. Chapter 5 of Deuteronomy. Verse number 2 says, The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. And verse 3, verse 4, in verse number 6 and 7, we find the first commandment. 
All right. Verse number two, we find the second commandment. Verse number 11, the third commandment. Verse number 12, the fourth commandment. Verse number 16, the fifth commandment. Verse 17, all the way through verse 21, we find the sixth through the tenth commandment. So from Horeb came two things. What two things, my friends? From Horeb came the water of life. From Horeb also came God's Ten Commandments. What was God teaching to ancient Israel, which is also applicable to us in these last days? For their sojourn typifies our journey in these last days. God was showing them as they were dying literally of thirst, the only way that they could preserve life, they had to partake of the water which typified Christ. Again, the only way that they could preserve life, they had to partake of Christ. So now, when God declared and announced and proclaimed His Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai, those Ten Commandments shows, those Ten Commandments show how we are to live. The Ten Commandments, they show us what spiritual life is is but the ten commandments do not give us spiritual life the ten commandments only show us what spiritual life is but the ten commandments do not give us spiritual life so in order for us now to receive that spiritual life we must partake of the spiritual drink and the spiritual drink is jesus christ Let's make the application now, my friends. Look with me at Romans chapter 8. Close Deuteronomy chapter 5. Hold your place in Exodus chapter 17. Let's turn our Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 verse 3 says, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh for what purpose verse 4 so that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but who walk after the spirit so the bible is telling us that in the flesh in sinful flesh that we cannot obey the Ten Commandments even though the Ten Commandments show us what spiritual life is. But as we meditate on the words of Jesus Christ, which represent us drinking in Christ, us partaking of that spiritual water, that spiritual drink, then Christ will give us power to live in harmony with the Ten Commandments. Now we are receiving spiritual drink and spiritual life. Romans chapter 8 now, verse number 5. Go back to verse number 4. So Christ overcame sin, verse 4, so that the righteousness of the law, the right doing of the law, might be fulfilled in us. Then it says, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit, verse 5, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit do mind the things of the spirit. So as we drink in the spiritual words of Christ, evening, morning, and at noon, this is the only way that we can live out the right doing of the law. This is the only way that we can receive and manifest the righteousness of God's Ten Commandments. Go with me, Galatians. Galatians chapter 3. Again, from Horeb came what two things? The water of life and the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments show us life, spiritual life, but the Ten Commandments do not give us spiritual life. We need to partake of the water, the spiritual drink, so that we may have power to obey God's Ten Commandments. Galatians chapter 3, verse number 21 confirms, it says this, is the law, is the law then against the promises of God, God forbid. For if there had been a law given 
which could have given life. Verily, righteousness should have been by the law. So while the Ten Commandments show us life, the Ten Commandments do not give us spiritual life. We get it by meditating on Christ's words, by communing with Christ Jesus, by drinking in that spiritual drink. Go back with me to Exodus chapter 17. Notice now, so from Horeb came the water of life. From Horeb came God's Ten Commandments. And what you want to write down, at Horeb came Christ proclaiming the Ten Commandments as a whole. Christ did not proclaim eight commandments at, at, at Horeb. Christ did not proclaim seven or six commandments. He proclaimed ten commandments at Horeb. This is after they crossed the Red Sea and God gave them water of life from Horeb and the Ten Commandments as a whole. Question for you, when did the Seventh-day Adventist movement cross the anti-typical Red Sea? What date? October 22nd, 1844. In other words, after that date, we should see then God giving God giving to this movement the Ten Commandments as a whole. Did God do it? Yes, he did. After October 22nd, 1844, after that small group who were sorely disappointed with the, the majority, that small group went to restudy and pray and ask God, why was there a disappointment the day before October 22nd, 1844, one pioneer, namely Hiram Edson, was walking through that cornfield, going to the barn to encourage that small group of people who were a part of the Millerite movement, the great Adventist movement leading up to October 22nd, 1844. As he was walking through that cornfield and reflecting upon scripture, God re revealed to him that he did not return to this earth as they expected October 22nd, 1844, but that Jesus had moved from the holy place to the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to begin the work of investigative judgment. And Hiram Edson ran to that cornfield. And with a few other believers, this is October 23rd, they began to study God's word and realize we have now entered the anti-typical day of atonement, the day of investigative judgment. And that based on scripture, we are being judged by God's Ten Commandments. But the majority of these pioneers, they were only honoring nine of God's Ten Commandments because the majority were observing Sunday, the first day of the week, as God's Sabbath. They were ignorant of this, but they understood the investigative judgment had begun that we were now being judged by God's Ten Commandments. So they were studying the Bible thoroughly. Shortly thereafter, God now gave to Ellen G. White the vision to confirm the Bible study that Christ indeed had moved from the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to begin the work of investigative judgment and that we are now being judged by God's Ten Commandments and God showed her that there was a halo of light surrounding that fourth commandment right down early writings page 32 page 33 so now at this very moment god now gave to his remnant movement the ten commandments as a whole is that point clear just as he gave to ancient israel the Ten Commandments as a whole at Mount Sinai, at Mount Horeb, once they crossed that Red Sea. Our pioneers now, most of them, they began to preach with power and conviction the Ten Commandments. They began to emphasize and emphasize obedience to God's Ten Commandments. Obedience, obedience. The law, the law, the law. 
but the majority of our pioneers, they, they were not emphasizing the spiritual dream. They were not emphasizing simultaneously and proportionately with obeying God's Ten Commandments, communing with Jesus Christ, receiving the righteousness of Christ. They were only emphasizing obedience to God's Ten Commandments. And God now, just as he did to the Hebrews, by giving them the Ten Commandments and the water of life, showing you cannot reach and retain and receive spiritual life, obedience to my Ten Commandments, unless you receive the spiritual drink. So God now gave to this remnant movement the message of Christ our righteousness, righteousness by faith, and that both must now be proclaimed. And if we emphasize one above the other, we are unbalanced. Because just to preach, if we only preach obedience to God's Ten Commandments, just obey, just obey, that will lead to fanaticism and legalism because no man can ever keep God's Ten Commandments in his own strength. Now, if we emphasize just Christ's righteousness and we do not speak about obedience to God's Ten Commandments, then that becomes love sick sentimentalism. I mean it this way. There is a group of professed Christians all throughout Christendom, excluding none. All they do is emphasize the love of Jesus, the faith of Jesus. But that love of Jesus does not lead them to obedience to God's Ten Commandments. That is also fanaticism. That is lovesick sentimentalism. So the true message of Christ our righteousness in connected with obedience to God's Ten Commandments must be proclaimed now. Listen here. We are told in this statement, the Review and Herald, March 11th, 1890, paragraph 12, paragraph 13, it says, Brethren, shall we not, all of us, leave our loads there? And when we leave this meeting, may it be with the truth, burning in our souls like fire shut up in our bones. You will meet with those who will say, you are too much excited over this matter. You are too much in earnest. You should not be reaching for the righteousness of Christ and making so much of that. You should preach the law. Now, Sister White says, as a people, we have preached the law until we are as dry as the hills of Gilboa that had neither dew nor rain. We must preach Christ in the law, and there will be sap and nourishment in the preaching that will be as food to the famishing flock of God. We must not trust in our own merits at all, but in the merits of Jesus of Nazareth. Our eyes must be anointed with eyesal. We must draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to us if we come in our if we come in His own appointed way. Oh, that you may go forth as the disciples did after the day of Pentecost, and then listen carefully. And then your testimony will have a living ring and souls will be converted to God. Our message can have a, oh, a distinctive sound, a sure sound, a distinctive ring, a living ring. If we combine obedience to God's Ten Commandments with receiving the spiritual drink, the righteousness of Christ. Notice, that very statement shows us practically how to receive the righteousness of Christ. Because many among us, they debate and they have all these various jangling and vain conversation about what Christ's righteousness is is 
Friends, righteousness is shown by God's Ten Commandments. Righteousness is something that we do. But it is Christ's righteousness, Jesus empowering us to do what is right. That quotation shows us practically how we may receive the righteousness of Christ. Do you want to receive Christ our righteousness? Listen again. It says right here, as a people, we have preached the law until we are as dry as the hills of Gilboa that had neither dew nor rain. We must preach Christ in the law. Oh, friends, it says they have preached the law until they were as dry as the hills of Gilboa that had neither dew nor rain. So those who are receiving the dew and the rain, they are individuals who are receiving the spiritual drink, the righteousness of Christ. Write down on your note paper, the dew and the rain. We can literally say they point to water. Water that falls from the sky. That's what dew is. That's what the rain is in a literal sense. Water that falls from the sky. So that spiritual drink, it represents the receiving of the dew. The receiving of the showers, the rain. That spiritual drink, it represents the former rain, the dew. The latter rain, the great showers. So now, in a practical way, how, we may, how may we receive the new? The Bible tells us, as in the literal and the natural, so in the spiritual. Naturally, the dew falls early in the morning. And what was Christ found doing in Mark chapter 1 and verse 35? Rising up a great while before it was day, he went out into a solitary place and there prayed and there communed with his father. As a result, Jesus received the dew and the rain. In the book of Exodus chapter 16, when the manna fell, and manna is the spiritual meat, with the manna fell the dew. All right, friends, is that clear? Again, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 4 and verse 3, Christ, he wants to give us the spiritual meat and the spiritual drink. In Exodus chapter 16, what two things fell from heaven? In linked with each other, it's the, it's the manna and the dew. And the dew was received early in the morning. The last time we were together, we saw that this dew, it represents the Holy Spirit in the first stage. Growth, germination spiritually. And the showers, the latter rain, we are ripened for the harvest. And the Bible tells us, as we are having our early morning devotion, spending time with God, communing with Him, we are receiving the dew. And if we have devotion, correctly based on the words of inspiration then we are receiving the spiritual drink the righteousness of christ and then philippians chapter 2 verse 12 verse 13 may be fulfilled in us work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for it is god which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. This is righteousness by faith. This is receiving the righteousness of Christ. The spiritual drink. We don't need to debate and argue over what it is. Just experience it. And as you experience it, now go and tell it to the world. Go back with me. Exodus chapter 17 is that clear and notice now once God gave them the spiritual drink and friends I must emphasize father in heaven give us clearer understanding of your word pour out upon us the dew the rain the spiritual drink now before it is too late and help us to receive both is our prayer in Christ's name 
The point I want to emphasize is this. None of us should be fearful. None of us should doubt our salvation in Christ. As long as we are receiving that due every morning, as long as we are having devotion correctly and allowing Christ to live out his life in and through us. We don't have to doubt our salvation. We are receiving Christ our righteousness. And then when we proclaim God's Ten Commandments, when we show people what spiritual life is, when we proclaim God's reformatory standards, health reform, dress reform, music reform, education reform, heart conversion, God's standards, etc. When we uplift God's standards, it would not be as dry as the hills of Gil of Gilboa, our sermons would not be dry, but now we can share our personal testimonies of how Jesus practically has been giving us victory. So now we can show them, since Christ is giving us victory, to live in harmony with his Ten Commandments daily, to live in harmony with his biblical standards daily, he can also do it for you. And as they hear Christ, our righteousness being lived out in your life and God's Ten Commandments connected, righteousness and peace kiss each other, then my friends, your messages will feed the famishing flock of God. Your sermons will, will quench the thirst, the burning thirst of God's people. Back to Exodus chapter 17. We're heading now into deeper waters now, friends. Let's get ready to study and dig deeper. Chapter 17 of Exodus, the Bible tells us once God gave them spiritual drink, the Bible says the next scene was that they were attacked by, by Amalek, the Amalekites. What does this mean? Because, friends, their journey typifies our experience in these last days. Exodus chapter 17, verse number 6 says, God gave them the spiritual drink. Amen. Verse number 7, Moses named that place Massah, Meribah. And verse number 8 says, then. That's the first word in verse 8. Once they received spiritual drink, then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Friends, I've read this multiple times. But just a few days ago, I went back and I, I allowed every word, every principal word to have its bearing on the verse. Why at Rephidim? And I picked up my Bible's concordance. I picked up my Bible dictionary. I looked at that word Rephidim to see what does Rephidim mean. And the Bible dictionary shows that Rephidim, it means a place of rest. That's what Rephidim mean, a place of rest. So the Bible says, once God gave them the spiritual drink, then Amalek came marched against the Hebrews and attacked them at Rephidim, literally the place of rest. Their journey typifies our journey in these last days. So that tells me a modern day entity called Amalek will come against us. The anti-typical Amalek, Satan, will cause the march against us at Rephidim, Rephidim, the place of rest. What you must write down in the application, Rephidim, a place of rest, God has given to us a spiritual rest. And what is God's spiritual rest for us? It is the Sabbath. All right, friends. So verse number eight, Amalek marching against the Hebrews. This represents the Sunday law crisis. Write it down. I will give you four primary evidences to prove Amalek marching against the Hebrews once they received spiritual drink.
typifies the mark of the beast crisis, typifies the time of trouble. Listen now, Rephidim, the place of rest, Rephidim, God's spiritual rest. So now Amalek marching against the Hebrews represent a time in the not so distant future when God's people are going to be attacked because they are honoring God's rest. Look with me at verse number one to confirm. Let's say you, that you don't have a Bible's dictionary to prove Rephidim represents a place of rest. Verse number one says, And all the Israelites journeyed from the wilderness of sin, after their journeys, according to the commandment of the Lord, and pitched in Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. So Rephidim was a place where they pitched. Rephidim, a place of rest. This is the first primary evidence that God's people in the last days will be attacked by the satanic power, the anti-typical Amalek, because God's people are honoring God's spiritual rest, God's seventh day Sabbath. Notice again, the second primary evidence to prove Amalek marching against the Hebrews represents for us in the last days the Sunday law crisis. The Bible tells us at Rephidim, verse number one, Exodus 17, at Rephidim, there was no water for the people to drink. At Rephidim, every earthly support was cut off. And we're told, based on scripture and the writings of the spirit of prophecy, when the national Sunday law is enforced, when the mark of the beast becomes a reality, that every earthly support will be cut off from God's commandment keeping people. They will not be able to buy or sell. Right now, right now, now, the third primary evidence to show Amalek marching against the Hebrews, it typifies the Sunday law crisis. It typifies Satan influencing the apostate powers of earth, the wicked, to march against God's people in the time of trouble, which begins once the mark of the beast is enforced. Go back with me to verse number 8. We are studying our Bibles, my friends. We must not be surface readers, for surface readers anchor nowhere. They are like sifting sand. Verse number 8 says, Then came Amalek, and fought with Israel in Rephidim. We just address Rephidim. Let's focus now on Amalek. Friends, I've read this a number of times. But just a few days ago, I said, Dear God, help me to treat this study as if I've never studied it before. Reveal to me your word. I said, Now, who was Amalek? I took up. My Bible concordance, and I looked at every time the word Amalek was used and is used in Scripture. The word Amalek, Amalek is the descendant of Esau. The Amalekites are the descendants of Esau. Hold on there. What is God showing us here? This is Amalek marching against the Hebrews. Amalek marching against the Hebrews, to war against them. Friends, if you have studied the Bible, you have seen a similar account before. What similar account? Since Esau's descendant is Amalek, Amalek marched against the Hebrews, so we saw that literal Esau marched against Jacob. Look with me, Genesis chapter, chapter 32. Look with me. Before we go there, let's turn. Genesis chapter 36. I'm going to come back to chapter 32. Look with me. Genesis chapter 36. Let's confirm now that Amalek is the descendant of Esau. Genesis 36. And friends, when I saw this, 
I had a great love for the genealogies in the Bible. Do you know some of us, my friends, when we are reading our Bibles, many times when we come to those chapters that mention similar words as Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, Jacob begat all these genealogies. Many times we read over those things. We skip them, not knowing the genealogies are not there by accident. The genealogies in the Bible, they become keys to unlock other scriptures in the Bible. For example, who was Amalek? You have to go to the genealogy, the descendants of Esau to see who Amalek was. Genesis 36, verse number 12, I'll be there. Verse number 10 mentions Esau. Verse number 12 now says, And Timnah was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bare to Eliphaz Amalek. These were the sons of Ada, Esau's wife. Let's turn now to 1 Chronicles chapter 1. One more scripture. We're going to come right back to Genesis. Go with me. 1 Chronicles chapter 36 look with me first chronicles chapter 1 rather first chronicles chapter 1 let's take a look here at verse number 36 amalek the descendant of esau it says uh, the sons verse 36 the sons of eliphaz teman and omar zephi and getam and kinaz and timna and amalek the sons of whom? The sons of Esau, it says, was Amalek. Go back with me now, friends. So what are we seeing here? As Amalek, the descendants of Esau, the Amalekites, marched against the Hebrews. So Esau marched against Jacob. Inspiration says, the marching of Esau against Jacob typifies God's people being attacked by the wicked during the time of trouble after the mark of the beast crisis. So now this tells us the Amalekites who march against the Hebrews, that account also represents Satan stirring up the wicked, the apostate powers to persecute God's people in the time of trouble. Look with me. Genesis chapter 32. What we're seeing here, friends, is not by accident, and this encourages me and strengthens my faith. It's not by accident. The Bible calls the three angels' messages the everlasting gospel. And the third angel warns us of the mark of the beast crisis and God's people being persecuted unless they bow and worship the image and receive his mark. Chapter 14 of the Revelation, verse 6 to verse number 16. Amen. And chapter 13 of the Revelation, verse 15 to verse 17. So now, this scripture in the book of Revelation, it, it is telling us that this, this account has always happened in scripture. It's different persons, different locations, but it is the same story being told. God's people being persecuted by the apostate powers because God's people are faithful to him obeying his ten commandments genesis 32 is that clear my friends verse number one skip on down with me to verse number let's begin with verse number verse number six it says uh, in verse number six and the messengers returned to jacob saying we came to thy brother esau and also esau cometh to meet thee and four hundred men with him then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed Esau was coming with a mob to kill Jacob listen here friends this is a great controversy 
page 618, it says, As Satan influenced Esau to march against Jacob, so Satan will stir up the wicked to destroy God's people in the time of trouble. Oh, friends, as he accused Jacob, he will urge his accusations against the people of God. He numbers the world as his subjects. But this little company, but the little company who keep the commandments of God are resisting, are resisting his supremacy. If he could but blot them from the earth, his triumph would be complete. Is that clear, my friends? All right, so now go back with me to Exodus chapter 17. We are studying God's word this evening. So now, once God's people received that spiritual drink, then Amalek marched against Israel to persecute them, to make war upon them. And this scene, it typifies the mark of the beast crisis and the time of trouble. So what must I now receive? to go through the mark of the beast crisis, to endure persecution from the apostate powers of Satan. What must you receive now in order to endure the mark of the beast crisis and to endure the time of trouble? All of us should now be receiving the spiritual drink. And the spiritual drink is the righteousness of Christ. The spiritual drink is receiving the dew and the rain. And we can begin practically to receive the spiritual drink by making sure we are having personal devotion correctly, allowing Jesus to live out his life through us. This is the spiritual drink. How close are we to the mark of the beast crisis? How close are we? To the anti-typical Esau coming. How close are we to the anti-typical Amalek coming? How close are we to the enforcing of the mark of the beast, which must give us urgency to receive a spiritual drink? Don't tell me now. All your preaching, pastor, is works religion. It's both. We must get ready for the crisis, but we cannot be ready until we receive what? The spiritual drink. Great controversy. Page 589 and page 590 tells us the mark of the beast will be enforced in the guise to combat climate change, calamities, earthquakes, Heat waves, storms, tornadoes, hailstorms, tsunamis. Are these things going on now? Look at this. It says in Great Controversy 590, I just made reference to that statement. Look here now. This is CNN, March 17, 2016. Headline reads, February. Just a few days ago, February shatters heat records. February became the hottest month for the planet. Do you see what's going on here, friends? They are beating the climate change drum. We must do something in order to combat climate change. Look here, not only was February the hottest month on record since they ever began keeping record. Look at this. The Guardian, March. It says here, February, it says March 16th, 2016 says, headline, drought and rising temperatures, global warming. Listen, friends, drought and rising temperatures leaves 36 million people across Africa facing hunger. And what does the Pope say? Is the primary thing the nations must enforce in order to combat climate change, to preserve nature, and to care for the poor. He says Sunday must be enforced. Look at this. Oh, friends, we have read this. Laudato see, and so the day 
of rest Sunday centered on the Eucharist sheds its light on the whole week and motivates us to greater concern for nature and whom? And the poor is the mark of the beast snare. Just as inspiration says, look now, I'm telling you, friends, one more evidence that shows us the national Sunday law is near. The mark of the beast is near. Then the anti-typical Amalek will march against God's people. The anti-typical Esau will march against God's people. We shall now be receiving the spiritual drink. If not, we have much to be fearful for. But if we are receiving that spiritual drink every morning, every afternoon, every evening, then my friends, we can have boldness in the time of judgment because Jesus will preserve and fight for us. We are told in great controversy, page 588, when we see Protestant America shaking hands with Roman Catholicism, with popery, the mark of the beast is even at the doors. Look at this. Great Controversy, page 588. The Protestants of America will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. And then this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. Do we see an event, an event showing us the fulfillment is even here? Look at this. It says right here, Fox News headline. Let me skip the headline. Skip on down. This is March 13, 2016. It says, uh, between John Kerry and Pope Francis, it says, uh, U.S. Secretary of State, John Kerry extended his official congratulations to Pope Francis, thanking the Pope for his role in renewing the country's diplomatic ties with Cuba, as well as... Uh, his efforts to facilitate dialogue between the Colombian government and FARC rebels, F-A-R-C. The Holy Father was instrumental in encouraging talks between our two countries. Listen now. And the United States, John Kerry said, and the United States will continue to seek Pope Francis' support as we proceed with our renewed bilateral relationship with Cuba. That is astonishing for the Secretary of State of the United States to stand up and say, I want to continue to join hands with Pope And there's not one public outcry. It shows the church and the nations are asleep. Politicians are asleep. They are ignorant. And the church that God has raised up to make sure they give the trumpet a certain sound, those preachers are also asleep. Inspiration says, Protestant America will join hands with Pope. That was written all the way back there in the 1800s. It's now continuing to take place. Then God says to Ellen White, the mark of the beast is near. They will trample upon the rights of conscience. So what is next? The national Sunday law is about to be enforced. Kerry saying, we will continue to join hands with Pope. Listen to this. Great controversy. Page 235 says, under various disguises, the Jesuits and Pope Francis is a publicly announced Jesuit. The Jesuits work their way into offices of state, climbing up to be the counselors of kings and shaping what? The policy of nations. Then it says, wherever they went, there followed a revival of popery. So when Americans 
America's politicians are continuing to unite with Pope. It means a change for the worse has come to America and a revival of Pope is coming to America first and then to the world. And when Pope ruled the world between 538 AD and 1798 AD, what happened to God's faithful commandment keeping people? They were persecuted. Since a revival of Pope is coming again, watch out, save to serve international. The anti-typical Amalek and Esau is coming. Are we now receiving the spiritual drink? It says, great controversy, page 580, it says, the Roman Catholic Church, let's skip on down. It says, history testifies of her artful and persistent effort to insinuate herself into the affairs of nations. Is that going on? Listen. And having gained a foothold to further her own aims, even at the ruin of princes, of politicians, and of people. So what is coming for God's commandment keeping people? Persecution, a time of trouble such as never was. And what we need today right now is to receive that spiritual drink, we are told. Look with me. Hold your place in the book of Exodus 17. Let's turn our Bibles to Daniel chapter 8. We are told, my friends, that by peace, verse 25, that by peace, popery, the papacy shall destroy many. Just recently we saw this, this headline, Vatican Insider. It says, March 10th, 2016, U.S., Catholic bishops call for persecution of Christians in the Middle East to be labeled as genocide. Why as genocide? Listen here, friends. This is Pope Francis. He said, a form of genocide is taking place against Christians in the Middle East. Understand this. So Pope Francis first called for ISIS, persecution of Christians in the Middle East, that it is to be labeled as genocide. Nobody made a move yet. The U.S. bishops began to beat that drum. Let's call it genocide. Look what happened recently. It says here now, this is uh, the United States House of Representatives. They condemn ISIS atrocities as genocide. March 15, 2016, from Associated Press. And listen now what John Kerry said following Christianity Today. March 17, 2016, John Kerry now said, ISIS is responsible for genocide against Christians. Friends, is the Pope of Rome and the politicians of the United States of America all singing the same tune. Why now are the politicians of America joining with Pope Francis to call the persecution of Christians in the Middle East by ISIS genocide? Why genocide? Because friends, and do your research, when the nations declare atrocities and crimes as genocide, then an international body, an international army must be formed to stop that power, that entity, ISIS, from committing crimes and persecution and death. So now the Pope is calling for an international military. Just by saying, let's label ISIS persecuting Christians in the Middle East as genocide. How is it you could be a so-called man of peace, yet you are calling for war? Daniel chapter 8, 
verse 23 through 25, by peace shall the papacy destroy many. Let's, let's put together an international army. Let all nations now unite, oh friends, a one world military power. Between 538 AD and 1798 AD, which entity controlled the military armies of the various nations in order to persecute God's commandment keeping people? The primary bishop of Rome, the Pope of Rome, is Pope regaining her world dominance. And bear in mind, when the barbarians attacked and sacked the ancient Roman Empire, Emperor Justinian then gave to the Bishop of Rome world power and gave now to the Emperor, the Bishop of Rome, the Pope of Rome, the military powers of all the various nations to combat so-called barbarians, so-called terrorists. This is how the papacy rose to power in 538 AD. So what is going on when Pope Francis now has now gotten the United Nations, America now to say it is genocide. What ISIS is inflicting upon the so-called Christians in the Middle East. Look at this, my friends. Don't you miss this. Now, who is the perpetrator? Who is committing the genocide? Pope Francis says uh, these are fundamentalists. Look at this, friends. It says, uh, this is from just a few months ago. The Pope says, the pontiff criticize fundamentalism in Christianity, Islam, and Judaism as a form of violence. A fundamentalist group, even if it kills no one, even if it strikes no one, is violent. The mental structure of fundamentalism is violence in the name of God. Listen to me carefully, my friends. The Pope is calling for an international military power to now unite to fight a one common enemy. And the common enemy is individuals the Pope declares as fundamentalists. Do you know what he just said? Fundamentalists are found in Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. But the focus now primarily, it's on Islam. Notice now, my friends, the Pope says a fundamentalist is a person who believes in absolute truth. That means God's commandment keeping people who refuse to unite with the apostate religions, the apostate denominations, who refuse to join with the apostate policies of nations who believe in absolute present Bible truth, they are going to be labeled as fundamentalist. Again, the anti-typical Amalek, the anti-typical Esau is getting ready now to march against God's people. Listen, as Esau marched against Jacob, with 400 men, a mob, as Amalek marched against the Hebrews with a multitude of armed men. In Exodus 17, Pope Francis is calling now and gathering together now an international military arm. Why? Why is this so? Because God's commandment keeping people will be found and are found today in every nation on earth. So now Pope Francis must control the military power of every single nation to war against people that he declares as fundamentalists, those who believe in absolute truth, those who refuse to build bridges, in apostasy, but to build walls of truth. Look at this, my friends. It says, uh, 
Pope Francis slams Christian popes. Pope Francis slams fundamentalist Catholics who believe in absolute truth. So who does he say is a fundamentalist? Those who believe in absolute truth. Go back with me, Exodus chapter 17. Father in heaven, help us here. So what do we need, my friends? Since the mark of the beast is near, the anti-typical Amalek is about to march against God's people. What do we need now? We need to be partaking of that spiritual drink communing with Christ, allowing Jesus to live out his life within us. Look with me. The point you want to see here, that this marching of Amalek against the Hebrews in Exodus chapter 17, here now is my final evidence to prove it represents the mark of the beast crisis. Do you know, my friends? King Saul, King Saul grieved God. The final test of King Saul came on the matter with the Amalekites. Look with me. Hold your place in Exodus chapter 17. Let's go in our Bibles to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 22. The point, 1 Samuel, pardon me, 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 22. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, King Saul's final test surrounded the encounter with Amalek. Look with me, my friends. So what God is showing us, what God is showing us, Amalek marching against the Hebrews. It represents the final test for God's people in these last days. And the only way I can pass this test the only way, save to serve international, you can pass this last test is for us to be consuming, partaking of the spiritual drink. First Samuel chapter 15, verse number 3. God told King Saul through Samuel to go and overthrow Amalek. That's verse 3. And verse number 8, verse number 9 says... That yes, King Saul, King Saul speared the leader of the Amalekites called Agag. This is showing us that King Saul represents a lukewarm professed Christian in these last days. Why? Because King Saul, yes, he did destroy some of the things God told him to put aside, to destroy among the Amalekites, but he speared the head. He joined with the Amalekites. So King Saul represents God's professed people in these last days when the mark of the beast is enforced. They will join with the anti-typical Amalekites. They will receive the mark of the beast. They will grieve God's spirit. Verse number 10, verse number 11 says, Saul, King Saul, grieve God. And verse 22, God says in verse 23, Rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, God hath also rejected you from being king. So what cause, on what issue was King Saul rejected of God on the issue surrounding the Amalekites? It represents the final test for God's people, the mark of the beast crisis. And the sad reality is that King Saul remained on the throne. And the people, when they saw King Saul, they still thought most of them, they still thought that King Saul was receiving the authority and the blessings from God, but King Saul had grieved God's Holy Spirit. I wonder who does King Saul represent today? Well, let me tell you this. King Saul will represent the pastors, the professors within Seventh-day Adventism who are joining with the modern-day Amalekites, 
who are joining with the Babylonians. So those pastors and professors who are inviting into Seventh-day Adventist churches and schools, the pastors, the singers from Babylon, these pastors are the modern-day King Saul's. Yes, my friends, and notice, it grieved God. It's time to wake up, my friends. It's time for us to partake of that spiritual drink. Notice, so while King Saul was rejected by God because he joined with the Amalekites, instead of rejecting the Amalekites, guess who destroyed Agag? Guess who destroyed the Amalekites? Number one, the person, write down, the person that destroyed Agag was Samuel. Samuel minced him in pieces. Now, the person that overthrew the Amalekites, when God told him to destroy the Amalekites, that person was David. Notice, friends, Saul was anointed, David was anointed. Saul was rejected, but still had the prominent position. And Saul caused David to be a fugitive in the land. Saul persecuted David. So David, in the context, would represent self-supporting ministries, true self-supporting ministers. And when God told David, to go and destroy the Amalekites, the Bible says that David destroyed both root and branches. Look with me. 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30. It was in this account. 1 Samuel 30, the Bible says the Amalekites had, had captured the woman of Israel. It says they took away their goods. They took away everything in the camp. The Amalekites represent the Sunday law crisis. Wherein families may be separated. Where brethren may be separated. If you don't get what I'm saying clearly, just go back and read 1 Samuel 30, verse 1, all the way through. Verse number 18 and 21, and the Bible says in verse number 18, uh, go back to verse number 17, it says, And David smote them from the twilight even unto the evening of the next day, and there escaped not a man of them. And verse number 17, And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. So now David met the final test as well. Where King Saul failed, David overcame. Praise God, my friends. Go back with me. Exodus chapter 17. I'm telling you. And the reason why King Saul failed the test with Amalek, the Amalekites, it was because King Saul previously did not receive the spiritual drink. King Saul had begun to disobey God's word step by step. And when the final test came, King Saul made shipwreck of his salvation. So what is God saying to us? Let me quote the statement for you. Testaments for the church. Volume 5, page 81 says, The time of test is right upon us. The mark of the beast will be urged upon us. Those who have step by step, Yielded to worldly demands and conformed to worldly customs will not find it a hard matter to yield to the powers that be. So those who are rejecting God's principles step by step by step now will fail when the final test comes, when the modern day Amalek, the modern day Esau come, when the mark of the beast is enforced. Go back with me. Are these points clear, my friends? We are studying God's word. Exodus chapter 17. Notice now, Amalek marched against whom? March against the Hebrews. The next application, you want to write down, while, while Amalek, 
represents, follow me, represents the apostate wicked world. Amalek also represents for us in the last days our siblings and professed Christians in the church, our brethren and sisters of our faith. Why do I say so? Amalek was the descendant of Esau. Esau marched against Jacob. Amen. Esau was the brother of Jacob. Amalek, brethren of the Hebrews, but the apostate ones. So in the last days, our siblings will betray us. Yes, read Great Controversy, page 608. In the last days, our siblings will betray us if they are unconverted. Jesus says, I am going to send a sword. Fathers will betray son. Mother will betray daughter. In laws against brother. In laws against daughter and son. It's coming. Jesus says, brother shall betray brother. Matthew 10 verse 34 and onward. Matthew 24 verse 7 and onward. Esau, a brother of Jacob, the Amalekites, brethren of the Hebrews. This account represents our own brethren betraying us to the world. And the only way we will be able to stand this crisis and have a pure mind is for us every single day to be partaking of that spiritual drink. Go back with me to Exodus chapter 17. Notice, my friends, we must partake of that spiritual meat and that spiritual drink. One more application for you. What was Christ serving his disciples just before Judas Iscariot brought the mob of men to capture Jesus and persecute him? Tell me, my friends, what was Christ offering? What did Christ serve his disciples in that upper room? He served them the bread. He served them the cup. He was serving them spiritual bread and spiritual drink. For Jesus says, take of this bread, partake of it. It represents my body that will be given for you. Jesus says here, take this cup, drink of it. Jesus says, it represents my blood. I was shed for you. He was offering them spiritual meat. He was offering them spiritual drink before that crisis. Do you see it, my friends? Go back to Exodus chapter 17. So verse number six, once God gave them spiritual drink, verse number eight says, the next thing was Amalek came to make war against God's people. Their sojourn typifies our journey in these last days. Let's bring this to a close. Skip on down now to verse number nine. What happened that caused Jesus to give them victory? The Hebrews. The Bible says that Moses went up into the mount and he took with him Aaron and Ur. And the Bible says Joshua and the armies of Israel were in the valley of Rephidim. And when the Amalekites marched against the Hebrews, the Bible says, as long as Moses kept his hands lifted and raised upward, the Bible says that Joshua and the Hebrews had victory. But whenever the hands of Moses went down, then the Amalekites had the upper hand in the battle. And as the hands of Moses were getting weak, the Bible says, Aaron raised one hand upward still. Ur raised the other hand upward still. And as long as the hands of Moses were raised upward, victory was given to Joshua and the Hebrews in the valley. One application of this for us is this. We must be praying for each other. As Moses was praying in the mount for the Hebrews in the valley, in the battle, victory was theirs. 
That's why, friends, every single day when we go to Jesus, every single day when I go to Christ to receive that spiritual drink, I open up my prayer list and I am praying for various for various individuals like Moses I'm lifting them up in prayer which means if we don't pray for each other it's a possibility we will be overcome by the wicked one yes and if we do it now when the mark of the beast is enforced, we will pray for each other and strengthen each other. If that's clear, my friends, just say amen. Notice, Moses represents Christ in one sense. As long as Jesus is praying for us in the mount, in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, we should not doubt that victory will be ours. Would you say amen, my friends? And that's why I do not doubt my salvation. This is why I do not doubt that every single day, Jesus will give me victory. Why? Because Jesus says in Hebrews 7, verse 25, that he ever lives to make intercession for me. Not only for me, he ever lives to make intercession for us. As long as Jesus lifts his hand for us in the heavenly sanctuary, then my friends, victory is ours in the valley. Would you say amen, my friends? Now notice, the third application is this. The hands of Moses, both hands represent the law and the testimony. Notice. As long as the hands of Moses were lifted upright, victory was given to the Hebrews. But when and if Aaron or Ur allowed the hands of Moses to descend, to drop, to be lowered, then the Hebrews in the valley would be overcome by Satan. And the application is this. When pastors and professors within Seventh-day Adventism lower the hands of Moses, lower the hands of Jesus, lower the standards of God, lower the Bible's principles and the principles in the spirit of prophecy in order to baptize people, lower God's standards in order to have popularity in the land. They may think that they're doing a good thing for themselves, but they and the people will be destroyed by the Amalekites, will be destroyed by Satan, will receive the mark of the beast when that law is enforced. So how dare we lower God's standards? Go back and read The Great Controversy, page 385. Many say, we are told, to secure converts. The high standards of the Christian faith has, have been lowered. As a result, a worldly flood flowing into God's church carries with it its customs, its practices, and idols Paganism will come into God's church. And when people are tested daily, Satan, his agents, will overcome God's people. What are we doing, my friends? We should not lower the standards of God's Ten Commandments. We must not say, let's have Sunday worship to win the world, when deep down you all know it's a premise, a pretext for Sunday worship. When we bring in the world from the, the, the music from the world, we are lowering God's standard. So now we are told God is looking for men. Men who will not be bought or sold. Men who is as true to duty as the needle is to the pole. Next quotation we are told, my friends, God is looking for men. Men who will draw warmth from the coldness of others. Courage from their cowardice and loyalty from their treason. And one way in which 
it is without confusion, without a shadow of a doubt that God professed pastors, administrators, and professors within Seventh-day Adventism have begun to lower the hands of Moses, lower the hands of Jesus, lower God's standards, lowering the Bible's principles, and the principles of the spirit of prophecy, it is by the changing of our logo. Skip on down to Exodus chapter 17. As we bring this to a close, they won the battle. Verse number 14 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book. And verse number 15, And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi. And what does Jehovah Nissi mean? The marginal reference says it means the Lord is my banner. The Lord is my banner. What's our banner? The banner for Seventh-day Adventists points to our logo. On that banner is inscribed the three angels' messages. Look at this statement here, my friends. This is Selected Messages, book 2, page 384 on word. It says, the banner, Jehovah Nissi, the banner of what? The third angel has inscribed upon it the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Our institutions have taken a name which sets forth the character of our faith. And of this name, we are never to be ashamed. I was told that men will employ every policy to make less prominent the difference between the faith of Seventh-day Adventists and those who observe the first day of the week. In this controversy, the whole world will be engaged. And the time is short. This is no time to haul down our colors. A company was presented before me under the name Seventh-day Adventists who were advising that the banner or sign which makes us a distinctive people should not be held out so strikingly. For they claimed it was not the best policy in securing success to our institutions. This distinctive banner is to be borne through the world to the close of probation. And chapter 14 of the Revelation, verse 12, is quoted in that quotation. Do we see what's going on, friends? Write this in the book as a memorial. So when they see it, they may ask questions. But now we have this flickering flame. Almost every denomination, most religions, have the same three wavy flickering flame, my friends. An upside down cross, inverted cross, even the cheer of the Pope has an inverted cross. What are we doing, my friends? What are we doing? We are lowering the standards of God. Even here in central Florida, the, book, the bookstore at the Seventh Day Adventist Conference, the bookstore there in Altamont Springs, Florida, our bookstores were once named Three Angels, Bible, and Book House. Today, it was changed to Adventist Bookstore, the ABC. Now they're saying it's still ABC, but a better choice bookstore. A better what? Come on, friends. And they say, let's do this so that we can attract the world to come to our bookstores. So just to get money, we are lowering the standards. No wonder when you walk into our bookstores, we find books from infidel authors. Have we forgotten what happened to the Review and Herald? Between 1901 and 1903, it was burned down. Why? They were printing books from infidel authors. Go back and read Testimonies, Volume 8, my friends. Yes. We are lowering the standards. So while many of us say, I, I love my church, not knowing the pastors are lowering the standards. 
and when the hands God standards because the hand wrote the Ten Commandments when the hands are lowered defeat comes to God's people so who is in this movement to lower the standards in our churches all of a sudden now my friends oh let me not dwell upon that friends we need to partake of the spiritual drink and as we as Israel I'm closing as Israel partook of that spiritual drink when when the Amalekites came and the battle began did God fight for his people yes so now God is saying to us when the mark of the beast is enforced and we cannot buy or sell except we keep Sunday and renounce his Sabbath don't worry Jesus will fight for us our bread and water will be sure. What bread? Spiritual meat. What water? Spiritual drink. Our bread and water will be sure. God told Jehoshaphat, you shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand you still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. For the battle is not yours. The battle is the Lord's. And many of us, we have Amalek in our homes, family members, siblings. We have Amalek in our local churches, Amalek even in our home churches. But God says, if you partake of the spiritual meat, the spiritual drink, I will fight your battles. Praise God, my friends. And this is why I don't have to fear to wake up in the mornings. I don't have to worry and be overly anxious regarding the trials of any day. All I have to do is to make sure I get that spiritual meat, to make sure I get that spiritual drink. Early morning communing with Jesus correctly, and he will fight my battles for that day. And if you get the spiritual meat, the manna, the spiritual drink, the dew and the rain, you will receive strength to fight, to endure, to persevere through those daily trials. And you will receive the latter rain. You will be saved, sealed by Jesus Christ. One question now from God. Do you thirst for that spiritual drink? Do you, friends? Father in heaven, we are thankful this evening for your word. We're thankful for the clarity of your word, the depth of scripture. Now we can see the urgency of the hour as we look at current events. As we continue in this series, partaking of the spiritual meat and drink, convert us still and send us forward to do your work. Save us, we pray. And everyone who says, yes, Lord, I'm thirsty for that spiritual drink. Your word says, if we do hunger and thirst after righteousness, the promise is we shall be filled. Thank you for your promises. Save us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.